Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday, November 10th town board meeting. This is a work session meeting tonight. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in and everybody in the audience for joining us this evening. With that, my name is Andy Moore, Deputy Supervisor. A Supervisor Tony LaFountain is running a little bit late. He had a Boy Scout meeting that he was attending and speaking to, so he'll be joining us in a few minutes. With that, we'll go ahead and start uh, the, tonight's agenda and we'll start with uh, agenda item number one, call to order. Sue? Draw. Here. Cole. Here. Here. Great, thank you, Sue. We do have a quorum for tonight's meeting, so we will continue. Uh, moving on with the agenda, we'll go ahead and go to agenda item number two, which is approval of minutes. This is the minutes of October 27th, 2021. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilwoman Cole, second by Councilwoman Draw. Any comments, any changes, no, corrections? Great. All good? Good minute, Sue. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. Agenda item number three, monthly reports. Um, I'd like to add on behalf of the supervisor, we have most of the department head uh, monthly reports in, uh, the courts is coming in, and library, PCTV, uh, HR, and Public Works uh, will be coming in this week, but all other departments um, have submitted their reports, so thank you uh, to the department heads that have done so. Moving on to agenda item number four, public hearings. We do not have any public <laughs> hearings tonight. So we will keep moving through the agenda to agenda item number five, guests. I don't see any guests as registered. Sue, can you confirm that for me? I have nothing. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we will go to agenda item number six, which are action items A, which will start with the planning of trees and shrubs behind 1121 Whalen Road on town property. Um, looks like Councilwoman Draw will be leading that discussion. Thank you, thank you, um, Mr. Moore. Sure, I'll give you a little background on this. Uh, the resident at um, uh, 1121 Whalen Road um, contacted myself, the supervisor, with an email asking that they would be allowed to plant some trees on some property, the town property behind, um, in, in their subdivision, which is Timber Glen. Uh, that being said, I spoke um, with Eric um, uh, from the Department of Public Works as well, uh, at Mr. Tate about this, uh, a little bit of background. Last spring, uh, some dead ash trees, shrub was removed from, from that town property, um, cleared because they were dead and they were a danger a safety issue. Um, at that time, the Residents there apparently got together and decided they would like to have, they felt that it wasn't, that they'd like to repair, replace some of the trees or hopefully replace some of the trees so that the area would be more dense again, so more, a little bit more private behind their, their properties. They have gone, would like to go ahead. They have about, um, I had some pictures that I went and took that they have some trees that they, I don't know if Mr. Valentine has those yep. Yep. coming up. Um, the trees that they've, they've temporarily, temporarily plant, put, it, put in the uh, areas that they like to plant them. Um, maybe. Yeah. I don't know why these are not. And it's hard, they might be, you might be able to see it a little. A little you lost one. Uh, yeah, you lost that's, one. that's them. So if you can kind of see, I don't know, you can see. Some of they have tags on. They are actually in the in the town property, as I said. Um, you can see some white white tags on the trees. It's, it is difficult to see from if, unless you zoom in those pictures. You can see a couple of the maybe the white ones, Mark. I don't know. Can you see where the? It's a little hard. I think through email we lost a little bit of the okay the, the quality of the the photo, but I've kind of at least scrolled being, through the ones that. That being said, the discussion is, um, yeah, there you go, right there. Then they place them there, they'd like to plant them as soon as, obviously, this fall before it gets, the ground gets too, um, you know, too, too cold to, to plant. 
I guess my only concern with this would be if they were to do this, I know I've talked to um, Mr. Tate about this as well, is, is it is town property. If they needed to, if, you, if the town needed to get in there to clear, you know, for some reason, you know, to clear an area in there, we would not, the town would not be liable for those trees, uh, you know, for the replacement of them, because it would be on our property. And I would think that if we did something like this, I'd like to see a written agreement that, um, that something like this, you know, that leaves the town, uh, you know, not liable, so that if something happens and these trees were to happen to die too, or the bushes die, that we're not responsible at all because it is on our property. So I guess I, I go turn it over, ask Mr. Tate what he, what his opinion is um, about this, uh, this proposal. Uh, so we have allowed, uh, I guess residents have come in the past with the, idea or request to plant trees on town property uh, more specifically or, or I guess more frequently it tends to be that they would like to donate a tree and have that planted within a town park um, of which you know they, they provide the tree we <coughs> dig the hole we plant it uh, we care for that and we chose choose the actual location um, you know this area being being you know while it is town property it, it's not um, it, it's not it, it's connected to but not you know, directly around a stormwater management pond, mm -hmm. um, it, it really wouldn't have any impact or, or should have minimal impact on, you know, anything that we would need to do. Um, you know, we don't have any utilities um, in that location that I'm aware of. Um, I, I, I don't foresee them causing an issue, um, but, you know, with the same, you know, as, or I guess as you indicated, you know, certainly with the understanding uh, that if it were to be approved that, you know, we do have the ability to take the trees out if, you know, they present a, a hazardous, you know, situation, if they die, um, if we need to gain access through there to get back to the pond at some point in time mm -hmm. that, you know, they, they may need to, you know, be taken out, you know, just to create that um, access lane. Fair to say that um, then a proposal is something a written documentation stating this and having the the homeowner sign that would be something that you would encourage yeah I, I I don't know exactly what that would look like I think that's certainly something that the town attorney would need to you know help assist with mm -hmm. and, and certainly review um, whether it's you know some type or, or version of a hold harmless agreement mm -hmm. um, I'm I don't know the specifics and don't want to speak on behalf of them. Would you want to have um, the ability to help choose what plantings go in there because it is on town property or, you know, is that, that a consideration? So I, I know that the, I haven't had a chance to get over there myself. I do know the, um, or, or I'm under the understanding that the, the ribbons that they have placed identify what type of tree, you know, maybe that's something that our you know, our landscape con consultant can take a look at and you know review as part of it uh, just to make sure that you know we would be acceptable or accepting of the type you know species variety of trees you know and or bushes that are proposed to be planted he did they did uh, indicate to us that he worked with a landscaper about what kind of trees would be would do well up in there crimsons or some of them there was a whole list of um, some already that he's that that they've had the landscapers work with them on what would do well in that area. So he said he, I everyone mean, was happy. Anyone was welcome to come and you know take a look at those as well. So yeah. I mean that's that's the only thing is you just want to have a little control because it's town property. You don't want to have just anything go up on that land, and then mm -hmm. you got to worry about if something happens to these trees, will the town come and take them away because it's on our property? It's with it. Because it is on our town property, they're just planting in the kind of so, like in the interim. You know, I think as as part of it, we certainly would have the ability to you know manage you know prune if needed, um, you know, and or remove those trees if if we identified them. Okay, so that could all be in the written statement you speak of. I I think that would be fine. I think they would be very agreeable to that. They understand that 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 there was precedent before that someone had planted you know people someone had planted trees on our property and with no, um, un with the understanding that something happened to those trees or they had to come down, that the that, uh, homeowner, that the town was not liable for um, replacing those trees at all. 
So you want to move it to go? I would like to move it that we move forward with the um, the agreement that uh, that the town attorney. I don't. Is, would that be the town attorney and? Yeah, I, I would say that the agreement would be, you know, subject to review by the town supervisor and town attorney, um, you know, and also contingent on the the actual review of what of what's know, going and, in the and location of each of the the plantings. Okay, I second that. Okay. okay, so we've got a motion by Councilwoman Draw, second by Councilwoman Cole. Um, just real quick before we go to a vote, I just want to confirm the exact location of what we're talking about. I think. Mark, you, yeah, that's well, okay. So I just wanted to make sure that I was right on. There's three the homes there at 1121 and okay. then Extension Road, and then the other house is on that one, number one Timber Glen, that right. house, right. So there's actually four homes, I believe, that, that are part of this whole okay. 15 to 20 trees that they, shrubs, trees that they pushed, that they purchased in that, um, in the town developed, uh, town owned piece. Okay, great. Right where he's talking, right there. All right, any other um, questions or comments from the town board? Just for the record, the property in question that you're, they're planting the trees on is at 1985 Fairport Nine Mile Point Road. Okay. Which is town property. So we'll make note of that in any... It, it, it stretches through on the Timber Glen Trail. It's just that's the official address of our property is 1985. Uh, gotcha, it, okay. It's Thank a you. long connection that kind of connects right. off of 250 up through and then connects over to here. I can zoom out and show. Yeah, right. That's, All right. Well, that's we'll the entire piece. We'll just make sure that that's reflected. The mm -hmm. proper address is reflected right. in any, any agreement. All right. Having a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Hearing none. Motion carries. Okay. Moving on to action item number or letter B. Request for sidewalk waiver at three zero nine zero Atlantic Avenue. Mr. Valentine. Thank you, and I don't know if Shira, if you're here tonight, if you just want to come up to the table right in front of you. Um, so this 3090 Atlantic Avenue uh, was before the planning board uh, earlier, I'll say last year. Um, they did approve a uh, four lot subdivision, so one uh, new home along Atlantic Avenue, three new homes along Jackson, and then the existing homestead. So I had sent the board uh, the site plan that went <coughs> with that a little different orientation north is now to your right. So here's Atlantic Avenue, here's Jackson Road. So this was the old McKenna property. McKenna property, they had their barns over in this property. So this is lot number two, this is lot three, four, and five. So as it came into the project, it was intended to be a, a sold off as a, as a one unit to a developer. The developer would come in and build the four new homes. Mm -hmm as well as the infrastructure as part of that. Um, subsequent to that, they've been selling off, the, whether that wasn't possible, they've been looking to sell off the pieces individually. So uh, Shira is here tonight. Um, she and her family are interested in buying the homestead, the McKenna property, uh, as well as buying lot number two. And they're indicating that they're looking to uh, merge that in so they can have a little bit larger of a property, uh, keep the, the chicken coop barn out there, keep the house, they enjoy the house. But one of the conditions under the planning board approval, as is typical, is sidewalks along the frontage. So she's working back and forth with the owner to figure out what their purchase price is versus, you know, what is what is a requirement of that. It's so just part of that to get some clarity. Um, I suggested come into the board and, and see if a sidewalk waiver made sense or not, what the board's condition on that was, and then she can make her decision on whether to continue purchasing the home back out of the purchase or or not. So. As we've had in the past, since it was sold all as one project, we just encompassed, or the planning board encompassed it all as one. Mm -hmm. This board in the past has waived the homestead lot as the existing home of not having to install the sidewalks on the existing lot, but the new lots, and we dealt with that most recently on the Stroyer subdivision, 1030 Plank Road. Um, we, this board waived that cost out of the, the waiver fee. So that would be the frontage here and across here, and I've <clears throat> broken down the, the dollars of, the, of what that is. So that would be these two frontages, and then they're indicating to buy lot two. So then lot two is this piece here, and then they merge that back in. Um, lots three, four, and five would be new development pieces, so they would have to continue to install sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Sidewalk easement was already taken, so that is included already. But she is, is here this evening, I, I kind of teed it up. Um, you know, asking if the board would consider a sidewalk waiver for that piece. Obviously, she wants the home, she wants the property. 
um, but obviously didn't anticipate the cost of installing the sidewalks. And how, how far is it from Newberry Park's entrance? Um, Newberry Park, and I can pull up the aerial back again. So Newberry Park entrance is here. This is the end of McKenna Trail. So the sidewalks do abut the property or very close to the property on that west side. So this would be lot two is here. Here's the existing home that comes around the corner. Obviously here we are at Columbus Crossing and then continue down. So we do have sidewalks on Jackson up to this point. Uh, on the west side, we do have sidewalks here. So they are, you know, were integral elements that the planning board looked at as, as completing that sidewalk network. Um, but things have subsequently changed a bit. It's not selling off to a developer. They're selling it to an individual. Um, so she's asking for the waiver first and foremost for the homestead lot and then if they're going to merge lot two in with the homestead now that becomes all one parcel lot two is no longer a developable lot it's part of their base property so but we want we want connectivity I mean we want those sidewalks to go all the way especially there because it's at the town hall park so there's got to be a real good reason and it doesn't sound like it's a good reason yet because you don't know there's unknowns right there's unknown factors of how this is progressing um, so the overall, so the sidewalk waiver, I can pull up the homestead piece. So our typical formula uh, so for the homestead lot, and I can zoom this in a little bit. As we look at it, we typically go per lot, how much frontage, so the, the homestead parcel itself has 422 feet of frontage, at our cost is $47.50 a lineal foot. So to install the sidewalks would be $20,000 to install the sidewalks just on that, that homestead parcel. Um, if a waiver was granted, our typical waiver is 50% is of the construction cost with a maximum of, of $5,000. Um, for lot two, over lot two has a, a frontage of 156 uh, lineal feet. Our cost at 47 a lineal foot um, is the total cost of just over eight thousand um, know, dollars on, on that piece there so so it, it, it's obviously the question and sure you can you can speak and, and, and share your thoughts but I think you're looking for some clarity as you're looking to buy this home if the town board says no we're not granting a waiver we want the sidewalks then she's got to go back to the, the seller and say either reduce the price negotiate some, you know, so he installs them ahead of right. them buying it, but obviously she's looking for some clarity as whether the town board would consider a waiver or not. So. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I guess, can you hear me with my mask on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, you can take, take your mask off, off once while you're, you're sitting there. You're comfortable. Far away from people. Yeah, I'm vaccinated, so I can just, yeah. it's okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Shira Kasongo Cahill. I'm here with my family, my husband, Jean, and our two daughters. Um, as Mark explained, he I wrote a spiel, but I'm you covered so much of it that I can't <laughs> do it anymore. Um, but basically, yeah, we've grown out of our current home. We're looking for another home. Um, we saw this home on Zillow, and the way it was on Zillow was one home on the corner on a five-acre lot. So we thought that's what the home was. So when we went and saw it, everyone fell in love with the home because it's a beautiful home, and it's kind of where this is personal, and I know you guys this isn't part of it, but it's kind of where our personalities collide because my husband likes a lot of space and I'm a landscape architect, so I need something with, you know, some style or personality and, you know, an old farmhouse that was built in the 1870s is, you know, sort of, we could, we could agree on it. And our girls freaked out and they're like, this is where we want to live. So we all sort of fell in love with it immediately. Then we went back to walk the property with the seller's agent and we learned okay, turns out this has been recently subdivided into five one-acre lots. And they, we were like, oh, well, that's different, you know? And um, the rural character that we were looking for would be different if it was just the one-acre lot. So he said to us, you know, sort of casually, I'll throw in the lot, the adjacent lot, um, for, you know, a reasonable but, of course, added cost. And so we discussed that, and okay, that's what we want to do. And it's the adjacent lot that fronts m mostly along Atlantic but has a Jackson address with that flag that goes out to Jackson. So we believe, even though we haven't had it plotted um, in the field, that, you know, it has these large evergreens that would give us nice screening, and it just, like, keeps the rural character, and uh, it's just sort of 
our dream to live there in the chicken coop and be able to make improvements slowly and do all that kind of stuff. Um, but we hit a roadblock when our attorney rightfully said, listen, I'm not gonna approve this contract because there were these, there were just easements that we had to acknowledge. So he said, you know, because of these easements, you guys could be held responsible for installing the sidewalk. Meanwhile, the seller's agent had insisted that we're not gonna be responsible to that, that he's selling the other three lots to a developer who's gonna post a letter of credit who apparently is posting this letter of credit for $113,000 and has the intention of developing and installing the sidewalks. I have no idea what's happening with that. I mean, just completely honestly, but that's what I've heard through conversations, right? Um, as a landscape architect, I totally understand the importance of sidewalks. Love to have sidewalks on our property. Um, I understand the importance of the corner, um, high visibility, neighbor to the town, lots of traffic. Um, we would promise to be very good neighbors. We would promise to continue to make improvements going through, you know, code compliant improvements going through the planning process and working with um, the planning board here. But we simply just don't have enough money to install. 600 feet of public infrastructure, we just can't do it, you know? But we love the home, so we figured we'll try. You know, I've been talking to Mark, I talked to the town planner first, talking to my agent. You know, we've been going back and forth, but yeah, we're in this limbo where we can't figure out if we're leaving our home or if we're staying there or what we're doing. So um, it seemed like this was the cleanest way that we could get some clarity exactly as he said um, and take it into our own hands and you know ask for request this with the hope that we could move on to the property and raise our family there mark quick, quick question for you and i may have missed this when you were mentioning it earlier on the well, I, I should say, on the Atlantic Avenue side from the existing sidewalk to the west going to the intersection, what is the length of that? So the existing, I, so lot two's width is 175 feet. Uh, lot one's width is three, excuse me, 215, so I think that's a total of 360. Okay. So 360 feet is the distance between basically where McKenna ends to the intersection. Okay. And then they've got a frontage of 206-ish feet here on the Jackson Road side as well. All right, because I know, you know, con connectivity is something that we've been working on for years now in the town, especially when it comes to sidewalks. Um, and this is, you know, this is a, a gap that you know, potentially needs to be filled at some point from the existing sidewalk to the intersection and then people can cross that intersection, jump on to the sidewalk to the east and then head north up Jackson to the um, Veterans Memorial Park facilities. So, um, <coughs> and, I, and I apologize, it, Shara, is that correct? Shira. Shira, thank you. Um, so this, whole, this is before us because they're asking for a waiver from paying the fee for the sidewalk, correct? Um, they're asking for a waiver from installing the sidewalk. Okay. So right. this originally came in as one whole project. Um, the, the current owner um, was living on, we know it as the McKenna property, um, and then came in and subdivided it out. And as he explained it to the planning board, it was gonna be sold as one project off to a developer. The developer would buy all of it and then install all the infrastructure. There's some storm pipes that need to go back on lots three, four, and five, as well as the sidewalk along the frontage. Whether that didn't happen, couldn't happen, I, I don't know. Um, but then uh, Ms. Cahill has reached out to me and she's buying an individual piece, two pieces, and then you know people are doing other, pe other parts. So that's why it's, it's changed a little bit from what you know the planning board had originally approved, but this is the approved project before us. So as far as staff is looking at, this is, the project needs to be built, so that's why the option or the alternative, you know, to defer from that, it would be a you know a waiver from the town board, you know, against putting the sidewalks in. And that's one piece I brought up about the homestead is you know at times the town board has waived the homestead piece. Obviously, each parcel is different. This is a very important connection. It's very close to the town hall and close to the town parks. Um, you know, and then as well as the future development lots, um, they shared that they are not interested in 
you know, keeping lot two as a development lot, they would merge that back into the parent parcel. Um, so this would be just one big piece. So then is that considered the homestead or not? But um, so that, that's, that's why it's before the board. I mean, yeah. the board can say, yes, we'll consider it. No, we need more time. You know, obviously she's looking for some clarity to make a decision on to buy, not buy. You know, they have an offer in yeah. and that, you know, it's been hanging in limbo for a while and they're trying to weigh the, the price and the cost. And but this is the first time we've heard of it. So yeah, uh, and I, mean, I think it's, it's important just, that Tony and Bob weigh in on this because this would be this would be huge if we if we d decided this because connectivity is so important mm -hmm. yeah. and and in my time I can't remember ever ever waiving something that was so integral to our connection points because the one thing we wanted to do from the get-go for sidewalks is to make sure the sidewalks go to parks go to facilities because you want the neighbors to be able to safely walk to in areas now, for out some remote area, it's another thing. Then you mm -hmm. can, you know, a little more easy to uh, have a, a, a clear <laughs> discussion right now. But this is so integral to our, our master plan of, of sidewalk connectivity. I yeah, and I agree with that. And I really agree with connectivity. And I've worked in Penfield, like, with my office on parts of the master plan, and I'm familiar with it. And, um, you know, I would love to have sidewalks there. I mean, definitely. But I guess I would argue that I don't know who could buy that home and also make the commitment to buying, to putting in the sidewalks. It's, you know, I mean, it, I think it would be a difficult sell for any citizen, any just regular old home buyer, because the set of conditions that I saw are very typical mm -hmm. for a developer. You know, I'm like, I see these all the time. It's like, I'm gonna put in a multifamily development and I'm gonna sell 200 units. And so of course I'll make these improvements and that makes total sense. But if you're gonna sell to you know, X, Y home buyer, I think that if it's not us, someone else is gonna be here and say, we'd like to buy this home, but we can't put in this infrastructure um, unless someone had the intention of potentially buying all of it, maybe living there or unsubdividing that piece, selling it off or demolishing it and putting it, but I don't think you wanna do that either because it's historic. Um, we would respect that completely. Um, so I guess I would just bring that up as a potential issue going forward with whomever wants to live in that home. I'm actually kind of torn on this, to be honest with you, because I see where, you know, the connectivity and where we need to have the sidewalk there. But the one part that kind of gets me on this is there's an existing house that's there that does not have a sidewalk. And so somebody buying that existing house and living in that existing house compared to vacant land or a new subdivision with no infrastructure on that particular property, I think clearly, you know, the, the sidewalk requirement kicks in to where the sidewalks would need to be connected or would, you know, have to be created or constructed at that point. So I gotta be honest, I'm a little bit torn. I, I could see where you know the sidewalks would extend, where the, the homeowner would be responsible for extending it um, on that, the, the parcel, if you wanna call it there, on the western side mm -hmm. of what they're looking to purchase. Um, but I'm actually, I'm struggling with requiring the sidewalk on the property where the existing house is. Certainly heading to the north with the properties that will be potentially purchased and homes will be built on that. I think sidewalks absolutely should be required as, as a part of a requirement there because it's a new build, it's a new development. It, it, it wasn't there before. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit torn with this one, to be honest. All right, any other? Comments? I think I, I, I too I have uh, questions about for both sides. I agree that I, the connectivity to the sidewalks is so important. Is Mark Valentine, Mr. Valentine, is that the, that only the piece that um, Mr. Moore talked about that, that um, the, the open piece, that's the only piece now, that would be the only piece left, right? Uh, the only piece we, we, we would not have sidewalks on of that whole, in that whole stretch then, right? Um, I, mean, I can go back after to, they get the new I can after go back to the aerial. So this okay. is Newberry Park, Newberry, right? So Newberry Park has sidewalks across the frontage. We do have some gaps going westward, mm -hmm. um, 
the lot two piece. So if you did require sidewalks to go in on lot two, would extend it down, you know, another 175 feet. If you exempted the homestead piece, there would be no sidewalks here or here. And then lots three, four, and five would complete the sidewalks in those locations. So you would, if you did and say, okay, we'll exempt the homestead, but we will require them on lot two. Lot two would bring it 175 feet down the road. And then you would be a gap of sidewalk here. There'd be a gap of sidewalk here. And mm -hmm. then you would have whenever lots three, four, and five develop, those could be six months, a year, six years down the road that, you know, those pieces develops, you would still have some gaps in that, mm -hmm. in that section. But, um, you know, to, to Councilman Moore's point, you know, with the existing house and the existing parcel, you know, this board has made, you know, some exceptions in the past, knowing that you're buying an existing property and installing infrastructure is a bigger lift than buying a new raw land, developing the house and then developing a parcel. And wouldn't it behoove the owner of that property to, to help may, maybe help out on this and, and um, help you if they want to sell it? Because now that they've got these three other lots there, they've got, you know, there's property there that now potentially nobody, I mean, you guys I, want we it. We agree. When the next owner, the next person, a purchaser will come by. I mean, exactly. is, he, is he at all at the, amenable to you to uh, to work with you a little bit on that? We're not having very good luck, if I'm being honest, but mm -hmm. I don't know if that's because, because of the legalities of buying a home, mm -hmm. I'm not able to speak with that person directly. I have to speak to my agent who speaks to his agent. So there's a lot that's being lost in translation. So any assumptions I'm making are assumptions. Um, but it doesn't seem like there, it's, it's, it hasn't been free communication. It's been a bit difficult. Um, as I mentioned previously, they did say that supposedly they're working with a buyer for the other three lots who has the intention of putting in the sidewalks and for 113,000, I would imagine that they're referring to the entire frontage. I don't know why they would do that. Um, but that's what they've said, do you know what I mean? So, and from my experience working with developers, when you're buying lots, sometimes it works and sometimes it just goes away, you know? So I, I don't have any sort of security in terms of like, oh, this is gonna finalize in a couple of weeks. Um, but I agree, I think that they've kind of entered in a bit of a, I'm like recorded now, but it seems like a bit of a <laughs> quagmire where, you know, how do you sell a, a home when it comes with these conditions that, you know, you know, a mm -hmm. typical home buyer wouldn't be accustomed to and probably wouldn't have the cash for because like I said, yeah, we're not building the home, we're buying an already, you know, pricey expensive home that we love, that we can afford, but if it comes with all this right. infrastructure, then suddenly it's out of our reach and I think it would be out of many people's reaches and also the insurance and the responsibility and like what if you hit a fiber optic cable and like what if you, you know, break a water main? I mean, just like all of that that would come with working in the right of way, I think would be a hard sell to any typical citizen who wants to buy the home. Um, but when I saw the, the images of the spreadsheet that you had, I have a question. So sure. your algorithm or your formula that's showing how much the sidewalks would cost that was you know 20,000 for this piece, and is that a price for Penfield to install them? Like could that be, I mean I don't wanna say I wanna go this way. I really hope we can get this waiver and I wanna make that like our, our main focus, but if, is that a number that if we could get that number to you? If we could say, could you knock this number off of the house and we can transfer that, those this funds? Is the, or is, it's different, it's something um, that you have to install. The 4750 is basically what we've based the county bid price off of. Okay. So that's what the county every year and through 2021 goes out to bid. Okay, so it would be a private contractor, so kind of who knows. So it is knows. a private contractor. Right. We, the town, don't install sidewalks ourselves. We hire a private contractor on it. our own but we've kind of, to try to standardize around how do we compare apples to apples or years to years or increase of cost, mm -hmm. we've standardized around the county bid price every year. They've bid everything, gutters, new roadways. Um, so the one for sidewalks currently is 47.50. So um, by the time you add in topsoil and seed, you add in and there's some fill and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you're probably running about $60 a foot yep. um, you know, for sidewalks to be installed. Um, 
Okay, no, that answers my question. I just wasn't sure where those that, that's, numbers came from. That's the number we, we come from yeah. is we just standardize every year. We update that number. We see what the county bid price comes out in February, March of the year. We update our formula and then so at least we try to be consistent with inflation. Yeah, this year must have been a tough Construction year. costs. <laughs> to do that. But yeah, okay, I understand. So yeah, I guess we're, we're looking for just some clarity and understanding from, from the members of the board to move forward. Is, it, is Mark, is, is the other three, is the seller before the planning board now for the other three? So there's nothing? No, it, it's been approved as a five lot subdivision. But as it was explained to the planning board, it was going to be sold off to one developer. Mm -hmm. So the one developer would just do all the infrastructure because there are some, some piping that needs to be done in the back. It connects into the McKenna neighborhood. There's a catch basin back here, but there's some piping that needs to come in to do these other three lots. Um, there was some, you know, a new house was to go to on lot two that drained back this way. Then the sidewalks go along the frontage. So it was approved as a one overall development piece. Right, including this house. Right. Including this house. Right, so but can, now can we go back to them? Can we go back to the seller from the, plan the planning board perspective and say, you know, what's up? Because we want the sidewalks and, and now you're selling uh, off a piece. I mean, of we can ask, but we don't really don't have control of who he sells it to. I mean, well, it, yeah, it's, but it's, it's different than what was approved, right? This does happen over, it's, this has happened many times in the town over the years where a developer was going to develop X number of lots and then for some reason started selling them off one to different uh, builders. Uh -huh. And then those builders are responsible for the installation of all the infrastructure that would occur on their properties. You see that a uh, good example was on State Road. Um, where you had several houses running along State Road, which at one time was one subdivision, but they were sold off individually. The individuals had to put in their sidewalks, the drainage, all that business, as it related to the properties around it. Is there anything else that's going to occur because they they um, are taking that homestead off the table there that uh, they were supposed to do, but now they're not um, going to do that. Lots uh, three, four, and five. person will have to do. Yeah, the lots three, four, and five are the ones that are more complicated. Um, lot two had the sidewalk on it. There is a little bit of, of grading that, that drain this way. Um, you can see the easements here, and my apologies, I didn't bring the utility plan, but there is a connection to an existing catch basin and a drain that runs through lot three with a, an inlet here. A drain runs through lot four with an inlet here and then a, an end section here. So three, four, and five are kind of tied together, both with grading and with um, some infrastructure. So if these sell off individually, um, you know, that adds a little further complication. Um, but as the lots one and two sidewalks, you know, was the main piece, the existing host's house is going to remain as it is. Lot two obviously had some grading. If a house was to go there, they would have to run a storm or sanitary water gas. If they're merging that in with the, you know, the parent parcel of the homestead, you know, that infrastructure doesn't need to go in. So it basically it boils down to the sidewalk on lot two uh, across that. And then obviously the sidewalk across lot one, lots three, four, and five have grading and some drainage and obviously utility work if those are gonna, you know, be sold off separately, so. Right, I was just wondering about the sidewalks. If, if the, um, even if the seller puts it on the price of the properties, if he ends up selling them all off, it, it's, well, you said we've done it before, but still unfair. And we, especially considering this is a place we really want sidewalks, to have it based on individual homeowners to have to pay the big bucks when yeah. it could be less if you have them all together on a. Yeah, and then thankfully. Five. Buyer. She did her homework and called and asked the question. I mean, yeah, the asked. next home buyer may just buy the property and not understand there's conditions with it. And I've got the unfortunate job of showing up at the door and knocking on it and saying, hey, guess what? You've got to install sidewalks. So, right. you know, thankfully they've done their homework. They've called, they've asked and said, hey, we understood there was a subdivision. Can I see the approval resolution? I sent her the approval resolution. Can I see what the conditions are? Mm -hmm. Look at the site plan. So at least they've done their homework and, you know, they've already made an offer on the property. Um, so obviously now they're, you know, trying to see, they were bidding on a, a house lot and, and property, not understand there's additional requirements and conditions and stuff with the resolution. But thankfully she's, you know, works in, in the industry and, you know, has the wherewithal to yeah. understand there's more with it. If somebody else comes off the street and just goes ahead and buys it, they're not gonna understand that there's additional conditions with that house. So that. It's, it's a little sticky all the way around. 
It is, it's been it sticky is. all day for <laughs> like a good month and a half. Yeah, we haven't been able to figure it out. But I, I think that, I, I thought the same thing because I thought I'm used to, I've never presented to a town board, but I presented to planning boards many times and I'm familiar with what's going on. But if I wasn't, I'd be like, forget this. I mean, I, I think that, you know, if my mom, because. My mom was, I, you know, I consult my parents and there are executive assistants for everything. So they, um, you know, I think that if someone like my mother and my father were thinking about buying this home, they would just go, forget it, you know? So I think that it's in a situation that it would be very difficult to sell the home, period, you know, with, with it being part of the subdivision that comes with all of these conditions that normally come with a subdivision that obviously is vacant land to be developed and to make a profit off of when those conditions make sense. So, yeah, it's, it's a complicated situation. We totally agree with the connectivity, though. I think it's super important. We've always lived in the city. I like being able to walk everywhere. I like having a small footprint. You know, my neighborhood is important to me. All those things. Where are you, Borg? <laughs> so, where are we? Is that what you That's, That was so, the question. I guess, you know, and, and I led into that before. I mean, is there, I know you said you, you have an offer on the table. Is there a way for you to go back and say just what you stated there, you know, um, deduct $20,000? Is that what the, whatever the number ends up being about from your? Purchase price? Could, would would they be willing to look at that with you? And um, and it, to me, that seems. Like, I know that's easier said than done, especially. Yeah, I know. Mean, with that, I don't think you. I don't know if you can go back. That makes tons enough. of sense, right? I mean, it makes a ton of sense. I think in one ways, it's still we still are responsible for it because even if we get, which we would could be okay, but even, like as we all know, even if we get a price for the sidewalks today, mm -hmm. installing them when it's good weather or whenever there's concrete or whenever we have groups that are available because contractors are like booked until next year, it could be a totally different price. And there's a lot of liability that I think comes along with working in the right of way. As I mentioned, you know, like you have public infrastructure there that you could break or you could damage or someone gets hurt or, you know, I guess just being a regular citizen, doing it at work, being protected by my corporation and the insurance that comes with my corporation is one thing, but doing it as a private citizen is a little bit scary um, in terms of the risk, but even if that wasn't the case, we tried to have an addendum added just to get to the ceiling of a potential $5,000 waiver, and they wouldn't budge on that. So <sighs> we figured, let's just come to the board, we'll see what happens if, you know, they can see our super cute, awesome family, and they think <laughs> no, they really would be a nice family to live in Penfield, you know? Like, they seem like really nice people. They'll take care of this property and be good neighbors. I'm um, just trying to, like, pad it up a little bit. Then, you know, we could have potentially a number to bring back to them and say, listen, this is the number, and if they refuse that number, my husband and I could discuss, is this number, are we willing to pay this number to own this home? This is the home that we want to live in. So it would give us a path forward, because right now, as Mark, we're just sort of in the limbo, we're kind of floating, calling, and bugging people all the time, like grabbing a conference room, like, yeah. you know, so we're just trying to put a pin in it also. I can't see leaving that piece without sidewalks. I, I mean, I, I feel thing. terrible I just about that, you know? I can't say what you want to yeah. be said, yeah. you know? It, it's so hard because if it wasn't, like I said, if it was way out somewhere, you know, you could have a better, mm -hmm. right. but right there, where you really want sidewalks, and it's close to the town hall park and the ball fields and all that kind of thing. It's just, uh, it, it, you can't, I don't know, and all good conscience, I can't say, yeah, let's just grant the waiver. You know, what Debbie's saying, and I don't know how much, if, if there's any help, our, 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 our people can help you with it, I don't know. But um, I, I go back to that seller and say, hey guy, you know, we, we're not getting the support from the town. This is, I don't know, that's what I would say. And right. uh, what can you do because we really want the land and, you know, that, that kind of conversation, I suppose, because I, I just can't say yes to uh, a waiver. Right, and I understand that. I mean, I completely understand that the infrastructure needs to be put in and sidewalks need to be put in. But I guess I'm wondering if in the state that it's in, mm -hmm. if that's even possible because it's contingent upon selling a home to a regular homeowner that would also be willing to put those in. So, I mean, I don't think that we're unique in yeah. 
having this experience, you know, I think potentially somebody does it by mistake and then has to tell you guys, well, I can't afford it, right. yeah. you know, and then enters into legal issues with the town. It's a location too, though. You got to understand. Oh, I get so it. Location, yeah, it takes a huge. You know, it's an important. Importance. It's an important corner. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer. But Jim, Jim, and Mark. Um, oh, excuse me. I didn't oh no, interrupt I'm you. done. <laughs> the um, the owner of this property knows that they have to release this information to the any. You know, they make it known in 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 any of their. I would hope that dealings? that's the case. Yeah. This map has been recorded in the Monroe County Clerk's Office, right. so anybody that's representing them should be aware of the fact that this is there, and they should have access to it when they do the the uh, uh, title. But um, it is a good point. Somebody might just go in and buy the property, not asking those questions, and then they're stuck with it. The, the developer is aware of the fact, well, I shouldn't say the developer, the owner is aware of the fact that any developer coming in would be responsible for putting in all the sidewalks. Um, and that's how they would spread the cost over the four lots and the houses existing. Um, I'm not sure you could ever do that with just the one lot. Even if you were to buy that second lot, um, you could never recoup the, those costs. Yeah, no. Uh, is a non-developer. Right. I, I, so this is another question. So they have been, as I mentioned, the seller's agent has been telling us that they, that their minutes or hours or something very close to posting a letter of credit for the number that he gave us was $113,000, that which would include the installation of the sidewalk kit that the person who is going to buy and develop those three lots has the intention of doing this. Um, so that we wouldn't be responsible for it, and they know that, and the intention of selling the home, their intention of selling the home wasn't for the home buyer to install the lots, but to the future developer who would, in, who would buy the other lots. If that letter of credit was actually posted, and I have no idea if it will be, but if it actually is posted, would it be possible to get a waiver from the sidewalks for us contingent on that letter of credit and also us remerging the lot so we wouldn't be selling, we wouldn't go ahead and turn around out of here and then go sell the piece of land and try to make money off of it because that's not our intention. Um, and just putting it out there is. I'm not uh, certain. Well, we haven't received anything from anybody yet. I know. Um, we haven't even talked to anybody that. about it, to be perfectly honest. But I'm not so certain a lending institution would be granting a letter of credit for property that is not involved in the actual development scheme. Mm -hmm. So for your your property and then the one next to it there, that other lot, um, they may not issue a letter of credit for that much, mm -hmm. depending on the situation. That's true. If they did, though, <laughs> wouldn't Well, if they, if they just, did and somebody's willing to like, cover the cost, it's, right? it's not an issue because the sidewalks will go in. Um, but as I say, we haven't talked to anybody yet right. about issuance of a letter of credit. I think we're ready for a vote, Mr. Supervisor. All right. Listen in for a motion. For the for the waiver, I, uh, motion for the waiver. I, it's you know there there are, are uh, several things that uh, I think this board could do. Uh, you could grant a uh, grant the waiver. Uh, you could deny the request for the waiver, or you could uh, table the matter uh, for any additional information that uh, you might uh, ask for or look for. I, mean, I think those are your three options that uh, that uh, the board has in front of them. Grant okay. the waiver, not grant the waiver, or mm -hmm. table it. Well, if we tabled it for more information, it would be to see what <laughs> becomes of what you mm -hmm. uh, hear from your seller. Um, we, I don't think we have a full understanding because we don't know what's going through the head of said developer, uh, you know, seller. We're hearing from somebody who wants to buy the property and their issues, you know. So, um, without, I mean, uh, my my two things would be to deny it without prejudice, or the possibility of of uh, tabling it until we get some kind of further information. It may not ever come, but we could see. Hopefully, we get something out of that. Uh, the the person before us can speak to the seller. And possibly get more information back, and, and maybe it'll be a mute, mute um, problem in the end if, if they're willing to pay for the sidewalks. So I, I guess as I'm speaking this, I don't know if, if you agree. I'll make the motion to table for further information. May I ask one question before you do that? Okay. okay. Um, your uh, proposal, your to purchase a property, is there a deadline? Do you have a, a time frame on that? Today was supposed to be our closed date. 
so we've passed it. Yeah. But apparently, if we, I, I did talk to, um, you know, our broker, and she said that our interest is frozen until early December. So that's not a ton of time, but, you know, for us, of course, we'd love not to have to open that up again and reevaluate in the beginning of the year because the economy gets all weird and right. who knows what's going to happen. So we have a really good interest rate. So that's kind of the time that we're trying to operate within. Um, but yeah, we were supposed to close today. So. All right. I'll, I'll second well, the. Uh, before 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 I accept uh, the second, um, and by way of full disclosure, uh, the next time this board would meet uh, is December eighth. Oh, that's my birthday. <laughs> so that that would be the next, and and so I just uh, I don't believe in any surprises. So that mm -hmm. uh, if in fact this is tabled, uh, then the next uh, time that we'll talk about this is December eighth. Okay, so yeah, so no matter what, we'll have to make our decisions based off of that as well, but okay, we understand. All right, and uh, there is a, uh, at least a motion on the table, and I think about to be a second. I'll second the table. Okay, and I'll ask uh, further, further discussion by the board at this point. All right, so it's been moved and seconded to table this matter uh, to the December 8th meeting. I'll ask for a roll call vote, please. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. LaFountain. Aye. Moore. Aye. Four ayes. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you very much. All it right. was nice meeting you Please stay you in all. contact with uh, Mr. Uh, Costello and Mr. Valentine. We will. We all will. Right. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thing. All right. Um, we'll move on to uh, property and sidewalk dedication in Abington. Uh, and I'll uh, recognize Mr. Um, Valentine uh, for this, please. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. So uh, we received the request uh, from um, Crosstown Construction, and I, I brought up the aerial photo, probably best first. So the Abington development off of 250, as well as the extension of White Spire Lane, which is part of the Cranberry Cove development uh, requirement uh, during that review period uh, by this board was the requirement for a sidewalk or a, a pedestrian connection between those two neighborhoods. This is now on a separate parcel, so there is a small sliver of land, and please disregard the, the skew of where the aerial and the, the property is, um, but the property, there's a small strip of land which actually has an address of 30 Colton Court and 48 White Spire Lane, which go over this asphalt path between the areas. So they are asking uh, this board to take one acceptance of that, those two pieces of property, as well as the asphalt path that connects between the two neighborhoods. Um, I did walk that path today. Overall, is it, is it in good condition? Except for there's one area in the middle, and this is right about the center of the two properties. Uh, there's a sanitary sewer manhole in there, and there's quite a bit of settlement around that. So my recommendation, if the board was uh, to consider it, would be have them you know, cut out a, a, a piece and then repatch or, or re-establish around that, um, that area, the rest of it. You know, this is looking from the, the uh, Abington side, you know, the gutter, the asphalt path looks in good condition. The neighbors have all placed things along the property line landscaping. It looks like a nice, you know, connection between the two neighborhoods. This is kind of down through the middle. Um, and then this is looking back uh, from the other side. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, overall it looks good. There is just a, a spot in the middle that to me, you know, has some settlement around it I think should be there's a saw cut line here, there's a saw cut line here, so whether there was some repair done there and it settled. Um, my recommendation, if the board want to accept the dedication of that, would be to <laughs> require it based on some repair to that section and get that repaved. And I can say the uh, where the two saw cuts are, the that path was actually put in before the sewers were extended um, along, along those rear property lines, um, so that's why why you see them, um, it, it was just continuous before that manhole was put in, um, and, it, and obviously has settled since. It was a condition of approval by this board uh, that we do take, uh, that that become town land and not just on somebody at property with an easement. The intent was to make sure that it was maintained on an ongoing basis. So, um, is the developer aware that um, uh, that and and neighbors? Uh, because I think it's the responsibility of the neighbors uh, to know that this is a sidewalk that will not be plowed uh, in the winter. So, if this board uh, does uh, accept uh, the dedication of this, 
not only the land but the sidewalk uh, that uh, they're going to be required to fix uh, any areas as Mr. Valentine pointed out. Uh, the sidewalks will not uh, be plowed and uh, that uh, the sidewalk and the land will become uh, ownership of the town of which they'll be responsible of making sure they prepare the proper paperwork for that filing. Right. I don't, I'm not sure, but I don't believe it's ever been plowed during the winter months. Uh, well, I, under I understand that. Uh, but I also want to make sure folks understand that uh, because <clears throat> it's turned over to the town, the town's not going to start plowing that uh, chunk of sidewalk. Right. I'll have that conversation with the developer. I, I walked it today. He was not available uh, today to have the conversation, but um, if that's the board's conditions, I will pass that along to him and make and sure he informs the neighbors and he's amenable to those conditions. And Mr. Supervisor, just to add to it and to kind of follow up on what you were saying, Mark, to make sure that the developer repairs, fixes any issues that you identify from an engineering yep. perspective or any issues that Eric identifies from a public works perspective so we don't purchase something only to have problems, you know, or, or, or <clears throat> things like that. So yep, definitely. Thank you. All right. Uh, is there a motion uh, to move forward with this board? I'll move it. I'll second that. And moved by Councilperson Moore, second by Councilperson Draw. Uh, further discussions? See no further discussions, I'd ask for a roll call vote, please. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. LaFountain. Aye. Moore. Aye. Four ayes. All right, uh, we'll move on to um, Harris' request for conditional use permit at 1771 Penfield Road. I'll recognize Mr. Costell. Thank you. Um, as the board knows, we held a public hearing uh, last Wednesday evening on the 3rd. Uh, Mr. Duncan Harris represented uh, Penfield Hope, indicating that he would like to utilize the property at 1771. I guess you could bring it up if you wanted to on the area. 1771 Penfield Road. Um, his intent was to utilize it mainly as an office to provide guidance uh, to people in need and secondarily to utilize a portion of it as a, an emergency food cupboard. Um, he indicated that they would have two people on site at any given time, no more, and then by appointment only people being, being brought in for counseling. Um, he also indicated that he would like to um, install a freestanding sign. He showed you that sign. The sign complies with all of our code requirements for size. Um, I probably have to work with him to ensure that he meets the setback requirements, that type of thing. Uh, but other than that, there's no other issue at hand. Yeah, I, I feel that we vetted this out pretty well. I think the mm -hmm. presenters uh, were organized and um, spoke about what the mission and function is with this property. And I think this board's yeah. been pretty thorough about yeah. looking into it. So I'm, I'm comfortable moving mm -hmm. forward. Is that a motion, Mr. That, I'm sorry, that's a motion, Mr. Supervisor. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay, moved by Councilman Moore, second by Councilperson uh, Cole. Uh, I'll ask uh, any additional questions, board? All right, seeing none, I'll ask for a roll call vote of approval for the conditional use at 1771. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. La Aye. Fountain. Aye. Moore. Aye. Four ayes. All right, uh, we'll move uh, next on to Rafa's Park uh, Field uh, bids and uh, recognize Mr. Valentine. Thank you. So this um, was before the board in the spring. So we went out for bid for the Rothfuss Park Fields. At that time in the spring, we only received one bid. Um, it was 414,000 and, and change at that point in time. Um, that was over where we had anticipated. So this board uh, decided to, to pass on that. Um, we did receive nine bids uh, just this last week. Uh, so in front of us is the, is the bid tab uh, for that, uh, which was shared with the board. Uh, the apparent low bidder is Bel Air Construction at $290,666. Um, I'm in the process of doing some uh, vetting with them. Uh, I'm not as familiar with Bel Air Construction. Did have a conversation with the owner on the phone. Did sound like he, um, you know, understood the project, knows what's going on. Um, I have requested to have uh, references from him. I'd like to make some phone calls just since I'm not as familiar with, with this company what projects he's worked on, where he's working currently, make sure, you know, where his insurances and everything else are. So um, originally had hoped to have some of those materials uh, ready for this evening for the board. Um, so that's why it was an action item. Uh, it's more of an informational item now, just to let you know we did get the bids in. Um, once we have uh, 
um, some background done on him, see if the board is comfortable moving ahead at that uh, $290,000 for those, those athletic fields. So I'll put it on a future work session agenda and see if the board is comfortable with, with their bid with that, that company and then whether you want to move ahead with a, a notice to award on, on this project, which would be a, a spring construction, three new athletic fields at Rothfuss Park, uh, completion by the end of August, and then you know they could get the grass to grow in late summer, fall, and then be ready for a 2023 yeah. athletic season. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, questions uh, questions for uh, Mark on this uh, item. All right, uh, seeing how there is no uh, action I, action to be uh, taken this evening, uh, we'll show this matter as a uh, held item until such time as uh, Mark continues to vet that out. Uh, we will move, uh, we'll move on. Uh, this is requesting the permission to allow subdivision sign and right of way at uh, Piccadilly Park uh, subdivision. So. Good evening, ladies, welcome. And again, for the record, if you will, please uh, name names, uh, address for the record, please. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Jessica Ray Patch. This is my second time here at the town board. I live at 8 Scarborough Park in Penfield. Uh, my name is Luda Navarrete, and I live at Four Scarborough Park. Right, thank you, ladies. Okay. So, yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if Mark, did you want to open up, or do you want me just to? Uh... If you want to jump in, I can. Sure. What I, you start off, and then I'll I'll sure. chime in as needed. Okay. That's why we have two guys at that table working technology. <laughs> they're, I commend them. They're very they're very right. on top of things. So, uh, before, before you get started, I'm sorry. I, is there is there a reason why folks are in the dark uh, back there? I don't think the, uh, the maybe the, the light, light switched off or something. Is, is everybody com is everybody comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I just I'm looking out there and uh, I see uh, Mr. Anna Tomaso and uh, it took me uh, 15 minutes to recognize who he was. So uh, I just thought I'd ask. All right, sorry. Uh, you're, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, so, sir, the last time we were here, um, we were proposing that we have our neighborhood entrance signs replaced by newer, more durable material signs um, going in the same locations that they, they've been for the last 20 years. Um, I had to come back because um, the, the, we had a neighbor on the end cap. Um, he had a historic property, and also I didn't realize how strongly they were against um, the mm -hmm. signs. So we um, immediately went to the other neighbors. Um, and I'm delighted to say that we met Charlie and Bridget, and they actually have been a part of our neighborhood for 13 years. Um, a lot of our neighbors know them, Dawn is here, um, and they're like, you don't know Charlie and Bridget? They had the sign there before, and they're, um, the reason why we tried to go to the other side is because Charlie and Bridget have all the utilities in their, their yard, so we're just trying to make it, um, the ease of it better. But um, I talked with Charlie, um, I showed him the sign, I asked him if he liked it, um, if he had any opinion about it, if he wanted anything around the bottom, um, and he said he has no problem with the sign as long as we maintain it. Um, so I'm, I guess if, if you have any more, more questions right. for yep. me or? Uh, sure, absolutely. Sure. And uh, so uh, Mr. Tate and uh, Mr. Valentine, I know that uh, you have, uh, you and your teams have been working on this. so. Um, any additional thoughts, comments uh, for the board? Sure. Uh, so subsequent to the last uh, conversation, um, one was the update from the neighbor on the south side as well as to uh, locate those utilities. Um, we were able to verify that and one of our questions, concerns was uh, both Frontier and Greenlight is where did those go in that area? Um, they are feeding the neighborhood from the other side and actually stop at uh, two, one and two, so it does not go into that area, so in that area um, there is water, um, there is our storm sewer, and there is gas, and we don't have the gas information, but um, I can turn the water main on and then turn on our storm sewers. As Mark, as Mark turns the layers on, uh, you can see the water main, he's got kind of the sign labeled as, as the little you know red dash. Uh, the water main is directly to the north of that, and there is a gas main parallel to the water main, but on the south side of that sign. Uh, there is approximately eight to nine feet uh, separation between the two, um, and, and you know, appears to be that there would be enough room uh, to place the sign there. Um, I know Andy Savegas has reached out to both the Monroe County Water Authority as well as uh, Rochester Gas and Electric, 
Uh, he has received uh, confirmation back from the Water Authority. While they would like as much separation as possible, uh, they would be agreeable um, in accepting if there was a minimally, um, you know, five foot horizontal separation from you know, essentially where they marked the water main out uh, to where that sign is placed. Um, as you can see in the picture, the, the that kind of, and it's a little hard to see, but right where Mark's uh, kind of tracing that cursor, there's right. a, a white mark. Uh, there's actually, that's, you know, approximately where the water main is um, from lining up with the actual water valve that's in the the road uh, just outside of that picture. The two stakes um, are kind of where you're essentially proposing that sign. And then on the south to the other side, um, on the actual south, there's um, a few test tube uh, you know, and, and valves for the gas main that we were able to identify um, and, and kind of mark out where that is. And based on the mapping, it, it appears to be in a, you know, essentially a straight line as parallel as possible to that water main. And then the, the storm sewer is actually, there's a uh, catch basin close to the road, yeah. again, outside of the picture to the south, closer to the driveway and the edge of the road. And it uh, goes over at an angle uh, to the opposite side behind, it, it kind of crosses at a long angle to the opposite side of the road uh, behind, you know, where that the trucks are blocking in that picture. Got it. Okay. Um, we also took a look <clears throat> at uh, the site distance. Uh, we went out there and, and staked it out. Um, we wheeled off, measured to make sure it met the site distance requirements. Uh, at the intersection, so you could have clear sight distance either mm -hmm. side. So this is kind of a side view, looking at you know where the sign would sit. Uh, this is the eight-foot distance. I'm not quite four feet high with the stakes, is, is what they had, but we did try to kind of simulate where the sign would sit, uh, showing you know where the gas main is on the back side, the water is on the front side, and then the storm sewers running here behind it. So fortunately, frontier is out of the way, green lights out of the way, the gas and the the water seem to be uh, distant enough that it could fit back and approximate the location of where the original sign was located. This may be slightly back of the intersection a little bit. I think the existing sign might have been up a little bit, but uh, I think that was amenable to the, the neighbors of where that approximate location would go. Okay. We, we have not received um, anything in writing from RG&E, um, I guess, you know, from their approval or, or willingness to allow the sign, uh, you know, to be placed in, in proximity to their gas main. Um, however, it, it's, you know, this location, there would still be, you know, about four feet, give or take, uh, separation. Horizontal um, separation. Horizontal separation, uh, which is essentially the same as the opposite uh, end of the, the, water. the subdivision itself. Okay. All right. Board, uh, questions either for the applicants or staff? No, I think it sounds all resolved from the last meeting, yeah. So I just have one question. If I may. Right ahead. So there is a, um, will there be, um, I know I spoke, I think, to either Mark or Eric about um, written written agreements that um, how the sign will be, you know, taken care of and, and so forth. And I know the verbal, I heard right. verbal, it's wonderful, but, you know, if you ever sell and move away yes. or people change, you know, ownership and things happen about, is it a I legal mean, document? That, I mean, that could be a condition of the board is to establish mm -hmm. that. I, I know Ms. Ray Pitch has, um, you know, has neighbors, they have a plan, you know, I think having a written copy of that plan and then making that agreement of, of the maintenance and also mm -hmm. the acknowledgement, if the sign's not maintained, it isn't out right away, the town, you know, does have the right to remove it if it's, if it's not maintained appropriately. So through an approval resolution, we could document that as well as document, you know, what their maintenance plan is. And if they're not following the maintenance plan, we would look for contact information, which neighbors are on the maintenance plan, who's there, who's supposed to be taking care of what, um, you know, so at least we've got somebody to go back to and say, okay, right. we've called all 15 people on the list, either they've moved, they have no interest in maintaining yeah. the sign anymore, okay, we'll send a notice and then, you know, the sign isn't becoming disrepair, we'll then have it removed, but I think that's something the board could Perfect. Could add in the Good. conditions. And, and, and our neighborhood does have a directory as well. And so I have documented the 96 houses that have voted for the sign. So we have their names, their numbers, their addresses. I'm sure you have access to that, but then you'll know who voted for the sign. They'll, they'll know that those people, you know, know everything they, they need to know about the proposal for this going forward. Perfect. And I think the fact that you know the neighbor of the, the property that the sign's going on, 
makes a big difference too because okay. if if somebody's forgetting to do something i'm sure then the person will call and say hey you got to take care of the sign or you got to something's not right there yeah. so i think that i think it's uh, turning into a very positive result we actually added them onto our directory yeah. so anything <laughs> in the neighborhood if they have a, a problem with our sign yeah. they can shoot in an, an email to oh, the entire nice. neighborhood and say right. someone come out here and, and do yeah. you know the sign so good okay. Good. Oh, for the, Thank for the, you. For the board's knowledge, the neighbor, uh, well, you know, was while he was supportive of the the sign being, you know, placed kind of in the the lawn area that he's you know mowing and maintaining. Uh, one of the requests uh, that that neighbor had was that if at some point in time they no longer wanted that sign, uh, that they would have the ability to, you know, request that that be removed. While it's not on their property, it's you know, is within the town's right of way, you know, just want to make sure that the board's aware of that as well. Yeah, and I did talk to Charlie after we had a, an email exchange that was private, and um, I could send that to you if you'd like, but um, I think he was a little confused. He he has, he agreed to mow around it, and he was, oh, if I can't remove it, so the town's going to maintain it. I said, no, you're still mowing around it, but we are signing something with the town. He didn't know that piece of the, of the bargain, that if it's not, and if it's unsightly at any point, they have the right to remove it. So he said, that's fine. Um, when we had the first sign put uh, in his yard, he bought the house 13 years ago. The sign was put up about 25 year, years ago. And he said it fell over, and he called the FedEx builder to come out, and it took them about three days to come out. He said, I just want to make sure. I didn't want to touch it because I, I wasn't sure. Um, but moving forward, he knows that we have the maintenance agreement with the town that you can remove it if it's unsightly. And I'll make sure I can, I can CC everybody on that. Okay. All right, board, other questions? No. All right, staff? Um, can you just review the materials of it again? I think we'd just like to document what the materials are of the sign, the weather, and everything else. I know, you know, the planning board, we kind of document the colors, and so we may ask for a, sure. this is this, this is this material, just so we have on record what's going in. You know, and this, maybe the sign guy can provide that if, if you've got that information of what all those things are. I do, I do have it in an email. I can look it up if you'd like. and. And read it I mean, just if um, I just it looks like it's real stone but it's actually a fox stone um, it's supposed to hold up against you know the elements a lot longer than uh, most of the most of the monument signs you see are actual stones but then they grow the mildew and the mold and so at first we were spending so much money on these signs and I said they're not real and he said you don't want them to be real um, we actually have someone on the maintenance team that has said they will power wash the signs if they get dirty or from the snow and that's even better to not have the real stones because you can't really power off the um, the mildew um, so that's that's what the stones are the middle is going to be a dark blue a little bit darker than what you see um, it will be wood and I believe there's some foam material in the wood how he makes it it's Bob from Southpaw he said he does most of the Penfield signs. And we do a lot is with Bob and composite. He's probably using yeah. composite material, yes, yeah. with yeah. foam in it. Yeah. And excuse me, because I, I, if I'm wrong, I, I'm trying no, to remember exactly what he said. That's why I said he okay. provide us the documentation, but we just want to, you know, and I'm sure the board wants to know what that is. It's not plywood. You know, it, oh, right. it, it's a long-lasting material that's going to, you know, look nice for a number of years. Um, Southpaw Design has done a lot of work with the town and, you know, is right. familiar with what we've, we've got. So. And, and the lettering is going to be 3D so that he can do automotive painting. Um, we have our current sign that's standing. We've repainted it like three times. Um, there's so many things you can do with wood that's rotting to, to restore it. You just need to replace it. Um, so he had recommended that we purchase the 3D with the automotive paint so it should also last okay. against the elements much better. And this sign will have two stakes to be placed in the ground. So you're basically going back to what you did the first sign except in a more detailed fashion. Right, so this time it's going to be metal poles that yep. are um, hooked to the bottom. And he said he literally, they dig the hole and they pick up the sign and put and it put on it the stakes. On. And if, if there was anything in the, uh, the utilities companies had to get in, they could actually take the sign, pick it up, move it, and then put it back on the stakes. Um, so there's not a concrete foundation under this. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just, the, just the poles. No, no, it's the... just the poles, yes. Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. Board uh, motion. I'll make a motion, Mr. Supervisor. We approve this. It's a I'll second. Nice addition. Moved by Council Person Draw, second by Council Mo Person Moore. Uh, further discussion, discussion or and or questions uh, for applicant or staff, Mr. Costello. Just to clarify, this is one of two signs that'll be installed in the neighborhood. The other one will be re removed and then replaced in the same area. Yes, sir. So one on Dundas Great. and then one on yep. Scarborough. Okay. 
And and you've checked that out uh, for the sight distance component and everything? Yeah, Mark? we talked about it at the last meeting. That's the only reason I didn't Perfect. bring it up at this meeting. We were comfortable with that. The utility location, uh, the sight distance at, at the last uh, work session, this was the remaining piece to, to figure out. Okay, great. Uh, anything else? No. Seeing none, see I know one of the, the uh, questions that was brought up at the last meeting was the uh, liability for the sign, and I'm not sure if that's something that uh, had been that, ma that matter had been discussed because it is a temporary sign yep. uh, similar to uh, the street sign that's out uh, that identifies uh, the street going in and Qualtrough Road. Uh, comfortable with uh, uh, the town attorney was comfortable with that versus if it uh, were a uh, brick monument, brick or concrete monument that uh, was going to be placed. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yep. All right. One last opportunity going once, going twice. Uh, let's call the roll. Sue, if you would, please. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. LaFountain. Aye. Moore. Aye. Four eyes. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, ladies. Thank you. I appreciate Thank your you time. For your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, you'll get a letter. Uh, you'll get. A, you'll receive a letter uh, from the town uh, with uh, with all the information capturing that, so you have that for your files. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay, we will uh, move on to uh, discussion regarding possible development of additional parking. K two brewery at uh, twelve. Yep. No, back up no, one. We missed one. Sorry, I got I got myself ahead. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Costello. You're welcome. Um, the next item is request for special permit to allow change in ownership and operatorship at uh, 2567 Browncroft Boulevard. Um, sorry, Mr. Anatomasso, you'll have to sit just for a minute. <laughs> I apologize uh, as uh, as we go through here that uh, Chris that uh, didn't give you a coronary. So uh, with that, um, let's do a quick uh, update uh, as to where we are, uh, what and what's happened since our last meeting. Um, we did receive a letter from the applicant uh, that came in on November 3rd uh, that was shared uh, with the board, uh, provided uh, some additional information. Some of the things that this board, uh, you know, heard of the public hearing uh, was the length of stay, some concerns about that and uh, the turnover and, and what have you. And then I'll ask uh, Mr. Costello uh, anything additional that uh, has come in, uh, email, uh, phone call, snail mail, or anything like that that you'd like uh, to see added to the record? Yes, I actually had a chance to talk to Mr. Secor, who lives behind the building. Um, he was pretty supportive of the, of the application. I, he did have, uh, I asked him if he had any minor concerns. He says he still sees some lights coming through the uh, fencing area that his neighbors installed, but generally speaking, he's in pretty good shape. I did ask him if he had a concern for the soffit lighting in the back of the property. He said it'd be nice if it were turned down a little bit more, especially uh, you know when the kids are trying to get to sleep at night. Uh, but other than that, he didn't have really any concerns um, other than that. All right. Um, so let's start uh, uh, first uh, with uh, with the board. Uh, you did have an opportunity to see the letter for uh, Chris. I guess I would ask uh, any questions uh, that you might have for the applicant uh, regarding that letter. Okay. All right, uh, Chris, um, any additional comments above and beyond the letter that uh, you did uh, provide to, to the board on uh, November 3rd? Uh, the only one that I would have to add, which I just learned about today, is um, adding on to how Airbnb is utilized as a marketing tool for longer term rentals. They had their earnings call for their third quarter on Friday, and two of the items that they brought to um, investors' attention are that 20% of their bookings from July to September were longer than one month stays. And that is for the third quarter of 2021. And this stays of 28 plus days is their fastest growing category. So just, again, to reiterate, just because something is listed on Airbnb, it can be a, a longer term rental um, in line with the expectations of the board. Okay, all right. Yeah, thank you for that uh, input uh, and feedback. Uh, staff, uh, any, any additional uh, comments? that uh, you, sh you believe that should be added to the record that we haven't discussed either at the public hearing, uh, previous work uh, session, uh, or this evening that we've seen. Just keeping in line with what you did with the, the, the current owners, um, they did submit a, um, although I don't know if they, 
whether they followed or not, they did submit a leasing agreement uh, or some of the criteria that they required in their leasing agreement. It might be good if Chris could provide mm -hmm. a copy of that for the board as as an attachment to the uh, to the resolution, if that be the case. Okay. All right. Thank you for that, Mr. Costello. Board, uh, any thoughts? Uh, I think one of the conversations uh, was uh, related to uh, the rental length, mm -hmm. and uh, so has the board uh, got any thoughts or comments uh, on that? Yeah, Mr. Supervisor, if I can, I apologize. I read the letter when it was sent. I was just taking a quick look at it again because I, I left I'll give my you a notes at copy. home. I know that uh, you, <laughs> you got some old eyes work. I there. do. I need bifocals. I'm sorry. Share mine. Um, you know, I go back to my comments before, and I, I appreciate what the applicant's trying to do, and I have. Um, you know, faith that you would be a good landlord, um, you know, taking care of the property and stuff. But I do have a little bit of sympathy when it comes to um, the perspective of the short term rental and are we, you know, really allowing an entity to come in and rent a room for a day or two or a long weekend? And to me, that's not really in the spirit. And again, I'm going to reiterate what I said two weeks ago. It's not really in the spirit of what this board approved um, back some time ago with Miss Miss Wynn. And that, that's no fault to the applicant, no fault to your to you. I think it um, really goes to her kind of changing her operational model without informing the town board and not necessarily being. Um, you know, transparent, thank you, transparent, and in the spirit of what we approved. So I do have some, some reservations on just moving ahead and not putting some type of a, uh, you know, minimum type of stay on this property and just not allow it to potentially, you know, kind of revert back to, you know, a four-day weekend or coming in, you know, for a couple days and, and you know, going kind of back to that bed and breakfast kind of feel, or it's not the right analogy I wanted to use, but that motel, you know, boutique hotel kind of feel, which is, again, not in the spirit of what this board approved back some years ago. And so um, with that, and I open it up to questions and comments, but I think that we need to put some type of a minimum uh, lease or rental period of time into this resolution moving forward. And, you know, I would propose um, that we put, you know, something between a seven or 10 day minimum rental so that we just don't go down the road at some point in time of having, you know, one or two day rentals and then kind of reverting back to a boutique hotel, bed and breakfast, whatever analogy, bad analogy I want to use here. Um, so I, I, I propose that as a consideration from this board, and certainly uh, the applicant has, uh, you know, the right to comment on that um, for consideration. I, I would support the seven days. You know, it. <clears throat> I think what your presentation was excellent, and, and I see that you have experience and you really want to do well by this. And it seems that... It, the pre your predecessor, it, the main issue is that she was advertising an Airbnb for short-term rentals that were so short-term that it was against the spirit of the resolution. And I can, I can understand what um, you know, Mr. Moore is saying because I think we all felt that. And if uh, seven days, I think you, you said seven days was all right in your mind when you talked earlier to us because um, we had so much conversation on this subject. but. I think, in all fairness, um, if, if you went along with the seven days and, and, and submitted what your lease agreement would be, it, it, would, be, it would be a similar resolution to, to what it was with her, but a little more tight in its, uh, in its, um, in its resolution. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm hoping, and I think, you know, I think you said it before, that doing the short-term rentals is not is a lot of, it's labor intensive. It's a lot of oversight, a lot of management, a lot of supervision, labor intensive, so forth. And I, I take you at your word on that. Um, but I, I would feel more comfortable if we just had it in writing. And, and I'm fine with a seven day minimum 
uh, moving forward as um, a part of the approval of this town board. I agree. I would agree too as well. And you did mention that before that you were look applicable to us maybe doing uh, maybe doing the seven days. So is that you're still your feeling now? Yes, it is still my feeling. One of the other um, items that I had mentioned in the letter was, you know, I know even on the, the agenda tonight, there's an informational discussion about short-term uh, rentals and how the resolution for this property interacts with whatever the, the board decides there. Um, so in that letter, I, I had talked about having a percentage of available nights versus a specific stay because that would put a actual cap on the number of nights that, that meet that qualification. So if we move forward with this, the seven nights, every single week could be a seven night rental. But if it is a um, percentage based where one, two or 3% of the total nights available can't be, um, one, two or 3% can be what is considered more short term as may be defined in, in the upcoming um, short-term resolution, that puts a maximum amount of days that I would be able to have th the shorter term fill in rentals, which I think is more restrictive than even the seven nights. Because the seven nights, while I have no desire to do this, could be 52 seven nights across 11 units, whereas a a 2% would be, there can be only 80 nights across all the units that are um, short term, but that could still be a four or five, or five day stay. So I, I just want, I, I'm comfortable with the seven nights, um, but I just want to reiterate the percentage based thought that was um, at the tail end of that letter, that that may be more restrictive from a maximum amount but more flexible in that, that four to five range that, that may also occur for, for someone that's only here for weekdays and they're, they're not gonna rent a full seven nights. But you also shared with us that you really would prefer to have long-term rentals in, those, uh, in all those. Certainly, Yeah. certainly, and, and that is still my desire. Um, it is those shorter stays help fill gaps because while someone for a longer term rental may want to arrive on the 15th or on the 1st, the next person that is interested in that unit might not show up the next day. It could be a week, it could be three weeks in between, and filling that time in between helps maintain the property because it is an expensive property to, to maintain. More other uh, questions or comments uh, for the applicant? You've got that look. I, right I, ahead. And I only want to ask this only yeah. because in the spirit of this of this beautiful piece of property that you know historically I, I want when you say that you know you could have seven you know all 11 of those building of those rooms rather seven days a week continuously. I mean it makes us to me when I hear that it makes us feel that you know that that, that might be what you really want to do. I, I don't want to do that interacting with that many people mm -hmm. is exhausting. Um, and that's why I, I was saying the percentage base, which would be more restrictive, which would not even allow that level of turnover because there would be a total cap on number of nights that, that are considered short. So I feel it's putting a greater restriction on me while giving a, a flexibility of if someone wants six nights. You know, it's so hard to ever try to um, oversee this whole thing. And, and, and what you're proposing is even, it's going back to the winds as far as I'm concerned, because okay. that, that, <laughs> that was what created uh, some concern of other neighbors, that uh, it was so much of a changeover. So no, we want to get away from that. Okay. And, and that's why we're talking about the seven days. Mm -hmm. that, that's a little more fair gives you some fairness, but uh, that other one would uh, it'd really just be going back to the issues we had before. You, you I understand. Get, yeah. And if moving for, if to keep things moving forward, seven nights is what works best for the board, I can, I can be on board with that. Okay. 
right. Um, staff, uh, any additional uh, comments uh, or items that should be added to the record that uh, we haven't already discussed either previous uh, work sessions or public hearing? I, I guess the only question I have to Chris is uh, just a, a appealing to the neighbor's concern about possibly turning down the soffit lighting in the evening um, to get the kids to bed, um, if that's something you could consider. Yeah, I certainly would need to look at how um, they're controlled. Um, I, I think from what I saw the last time I was in the basement, it, it might need a different uh, controller so that they can dim in their, um, yeah. from a brightness standpoint, but that's certainly agreeable. Great. Was that the same issue in the front too? Was it? Wasn't there a well, there's, conversation about I, that? I mean, I, have, check I, I went by there the night and took a picture of it in the front. I, I've got to say, um, it, it's a very stately looking mansion with the yeah, lights on beautiful. in the evening. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really affect anybody. The church is across the street, and uh, there's a wooded area, but that's about it. Well, but and, and you've got uh, some street lights, and as well as uh, lights uh, from other properties. I think it adds a lot to the property that. Uh, that uh, it's lit up like that. Mm -hmm. and security security is obviously an issue. So maybe it's the right. same light, only it should be dimmer in the back because yeah, it's I facing think, uh, residents. Yeah, I think you've got the residents that live directly behind it, and they've got small kids, and they're trying to get them to bed at eight o'clock at night, and it's dark now at five o'clock at night. Yeah. So, uh, and I, and I don't know if they're controlled separately. It, it may be an all or nothing uh, adjustment, but it's understandable either way. I would I would hope that that's not the case because I think it looks beautiful at night when it's lit up. Okay. Could just dim it and, and you yeah. are going to put a sign package together that'll be forthcoming. Correct. Okay. And then Mr. Costello would uh, share that uh, with the board once you have uh, <clears throat> decided on some type of a design uh, look uh, before you committed to making it. I would just encourage uh, uh, to share that with Mr. Costello. He would share it with the board. Yes, Sarah. and the Historic Preservation Board will have to review that sign. Good, that uh, good point, uh, Mr. Costello. Good point. Okay. Other uh, questions or comments uh, for the applicant or staff board? No, I would, I would move that we approve this application with the uh, caveat of seven days for, uh, for the stay of individuals and that you attach the leasing agreement to the um, resolution or, or give it to Mr. Costello to do so. And, and uh, something about dimming the lights in the back and, uh, and referring to the sign package. To come back to us in the Historic Preservation Board once you have something to offer. I'm, I'm not certain that we need to make it an, a, an attachment to the resolution <coughs> because I'm not sure how quickly you can get that right. together, but certainly it should Correct. be part of the record. What part? The leasing agreement. Oh. It should be part oh, of the okay. record, though, as, as part, of part of his file. I thought it was yep. part of the, okay. I think Mr. Sure. Costello had indicated, uh, you know, to you know, to get that in, you know, as part of the preparation. Of, but uh, I think uh, having that in the files is what really is key. Right. All right. Uh, so there is a motion on the table. Uh, would I entertain a second? I'll second that. And uh, moved by Councilperson Cole, second by Councilperson Draw. Uh, I'll ask uh, any uh, additional comments uh, on this uh, matter. Seeing none, uh, I'll ask for a roll call vote of approval, mm -hmm. please, Sue. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. LaFountain. Aye. Moore. Aye. Four ayes. Right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Thank board. you for your time. All right, uh, we'll move on to item H. Uh, Anna Tommaso, this is for a discussion regarding the possible development of additional parking uh, for K2 Brewery at uh, 1211 Empire Boulevard and 41 Wilbur Track Road. Uh, welcome, uh, and uh, Mr. Costello, I'll just uh, look to you for any additional uh, comments, uh, input that we may have received since our last work session, if you would, please. Um, yeah, we had our last work session uh, on the 27th, 28th, I believe. Right. Um, I have not received anything, uh, either pro or con, regarding the matter. Um, thinking it might be a good idea for the board to maybe take a look at the site, as we did when we looked at Dr. Howitt's property, just to get a better feel as to how much area would be included in the pr proposed parking area. Um, I think it's good to get a feel for what's out there versus just trying to guess. And I know John's made an effort to try and get a map together, um, and certainly could bring that map down to take a look at it, but it would be good to just maybe walk that area and get a feel for it. Yeah, Mr. Supervisor, I, I totally concur with the comments from Mr. Costello. Um, I, for one, would like to go down to that area and just kind of get eyes on 
on what the, the potential size of a parking a lot would be down in that general vicinity, just get um, some yeah. some distance, yeah. some sight lines and so forth. So I concur with Mr. Yeah, Costello's forward. comments moving forward. Okay. Other thoughts, board? Seems like an yeah. appropriate next step. Yeah, I drove down there and I had a hard time figuring out where exactly what it would look like, so. <clears throat> so I, I, think, I think the thing that uh, we wanna do is uh, we wanna try to establish a date uh, so this mm -hmm. just doesn't yes. go on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on and on and yep. on, and uh, it might uh, give uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Tommaso the opportunity to maybe tie a couple of flags so that uh, along the Wilbur Track Road, uh, tie a flag at uh, this point uh, down uh, and tie a flag at the other point so that we know that that <clears throat> is located in that area. We're not looking for, we're not looking for a survey uh, we're looking for an approximate uh, location of where that uh, might be and where that might fit uh, in that area and a series of some, you know, <clears throat> a couple ties with some caution tape or some ribbons uh, like that I think would be, uh, would be good. And then I <clears throat> would like to uh, see if we could, uh, and, and I think we're gonna have to probably do that on a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and <clears throat> uh, with the uh, time change, things get a little darker and um, how and, and um, Thanksgiving coming up, I think uh, we want to try to do that more sooner than later. In fairness to to all parties, so if uh, we could do that over the next Saturday or two, um, I would be happy to ask Lisa to coordinate uh, calendars uh, with the board, with Mr. Anna Tommaso um, and staff uh, to try to do that over the next couple of uh, next couple of Saturdays. If we could do that, mm -hmm. yep. okay. Very good. Uh, anything else, Mr. Costello, that uh, that we have not discussed that you believe that uh, we should uh, enter into the record? Uh, the only thing, I, I, and this is not so much for John as it is maybe for the Kennedy family. I, I, you know, we talked about the size of the parking they're interested in. It's a, it is a big parking lot, um, and maybe we need to look at is it does it need to be as big as they're proposing, or could it be scaled back just a bit to you know to accommodate the real need versus what might be overflow parking? Okay. But that's something we can talk about when we get down there and take a look at it. It may not be an issue, it may be, I don't know. Okay, so um, um, uh, I'd ask uh, the applicant uh, any additional comments, John, that uh, you would like to add to the record that we haven't already discussed at this point? No, that's fine. We'll be willing to do that to make you guys come down there and get it roped okay. off for you. And I'll ask, um, I'll ask uh, Lisa to get that uh, coordinated uh, tomorrow to get a couple, maybe a couple of dates that uh, see what might work for everybody and try to do that over the next couple of weeks. Awesome, that's great. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, board, um, would I entertain a motion to table uh, this matter? So moved. I'll second that. Moved by Councilperson uh, Cole, second by mm -hmm. Councilperson Draw. Uh, seeing no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. La Fountain. Aye. Moore. Aye. Four eyes. All right. Thank, Thank you, John. You. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll move on to item I. This is the Greater Rochester Disc Golf uh, Town Acquisition of uh, Disc Baskets. Uh, if the board recalls, uh, the um, individuals from the uh, Ro Greater Rochester Disc Golf Association had approached the town uh, to ask uh, for uh, some consideration by the board to acquire uh, baskets. Uh, they would be looking to uh, pay for tee boxes, signs, uh, and things associated with that. And they were asking for consideration uh, to the tune of about $8,600 uh, for baskets. Um, and I think one of the things we wanted to uh, talk about uh, was, um, you know, laying out some type of a form formula or plan so that uh, as we had uh, other activities uh, on the site, uh, folks were paying um, you know, fair share reasonable so that one, one group uh, pays 50% of a value, the other group pays 25. You know, we, we, we talked about having some type of a, a scale or, or program for that. Um, and uh, so we do, we do have uh, an opportunity to have a conversation with BME uh, about the, the site in general, not specifically cost of baskets, but um, you know, is the board uh, prepared to have uh, that dialogue tonight or would they like some additional time to finish vetting that out? 
Uh, Mr. Supervisor, I'd propose that we vet that out a little bit more because we have to do what's equitable and what's fair to everybody involved. And if we need a little extra time to get to that point, then I think it's worth taking. So I, I would propose that we table this um, tonight. All right. Second. Moved by Mr. Moore, uh, seconded by Council Person Cole. Uh, we'll table this uh, matter. Uh, seeing no further discussion, I'd ask for a roll call vote, please. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. The Fountain. Aye. Moore. Aye. Four ayes. Okay. Um, so uh, that uh, brings us uh, to the next item, which is the Shadow Pines conceptual uh, uh, plan update uh, as we left it, as we left it uh, our last meeting. Uh, one of the things that uh, we discussed was uh, to uh, uh, take a look at that uh, that plan. Well, we saw the plan kind of of that uh, uh, north uh, east corner of the property uh, with pickleball courts, uh, some other hardscapes, tennis courts, basketball courts. Um, asked the board to kind of uh, take a look at that, um, kick that around, see if there was anything new, different, uh, any changes, uh, location of bathrooms, uh, any of that. Um, uh, myself and staff do have a, um, a conversation coming up next week uh, with BME, and uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, able to pass any of your thoughts or considerations uh, on to them. So any, any thoughts, any uh, changes? Any recommendations, anything that uh, you would like uh, Mr. Costello and Valentine and myself uh, to uh, push back to uh, BME? Uh, Mr. Supervisor, just a, a couple quick questions when I was thinking about this over the last week or so. And I, I know we have two basketball courts, two tennis courts, and 15 pickleball courts. And, I, and this may be posed to, to BME, which I certainly can do that in writing um, tomorrow or whenever, but maybe I missed where, is there, a, maybe I missed the discussion, and I apologize if I did, but is there a need for two more basketball courts? Is there a need for two more tennis courts? We know there's a need for some pickleball courts, um, you know, depending who you talk to, you yeah. get different numbers every, you know, every time from different um, interested parties in pickleball. And so we've got 15 designated. Is that the right amount? It, for me, that seems like a lot of pickleball courts. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, um, and I certainly will be the first one to acknowledge if I am wrong, but that seems like a lot. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just wondering if if there's some answer to that, and it, and it may not be necessarily be tonight, but you know, I'm just not aware of any real need or or whatever for you know the basketball or tennis courts or 15 pickleball courts. Right. And again, I, I could be wrong, and I will acknowledge if I am wrong on that. Um, and if there is the need, I'm good, but I, I'm not sure. I'm convinced that there's really that need for um, that many hard court surfaces at this property. I, know, just, I just throw that out there for consideration. We do have the recreation plan, and um, I, I can't speak to it off the top of my head, but normally something like uh, the needs of, of, from the survey of what people need is in that. And we could refer to that, but also talk to the recreation department because they know, they hear if there's people that want more basketball programs or they want more, um, you know, uh, tennis programs and this and that. You know, I, like you say, I, you know, there's not, you know, there's not that many running out saying there has to be 15 pickleball courts, except for some people that are very invested in pickleball. But it'd be interesting to uh, perhaps uh, contact the recreation director and see if they've been. You know, uh, requested for more basketball or, or uh, a tennis for sure before we go ahead and approve so many for one um, activity over another. Well, yeah, and I, and I would just, I mean, I would just hate to, to keep moving forward and at some point down the road in the future, you know, the basketball courts, the tennis courts, the pickleball courts get get built and then we see a lot of these sitting empty and not used. Right. Um, and I'm not saying that's the case at all. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just throwing it out there, and maybe I should have done a little bit more homework um, in talking with Andy Urkfitz and the rec department on the needs of those hard surfaces 
um, in addition to what the town already offers for basketball courts and tennis courts. And I will do that um, over the next day or so uh, this week. Okay. I won't, I won't, uh, I'm sorry, you go. I, I won't try to answer uh, all, all the questions. I'll, I'll provide more, uh, I think, observations uh, than anything else. I think, I think it's safe to say uh, in some conversations that I've had with a, n a number of different people, in, including some members of staff, is that uh, you know, pickleball uh, does have uh, a lot of requests. Mm -hmm. um, if we could uh, have uh, two, three, four, or more indoor courts available, uh, they would be they would be filled. Uh, they are they are filled uh, in the blocks of time that we provide. Uh, they're filled from from beginning to uh, end. I know the uh, the YMCA has got a couple of uh, pickleball courts, and they're yeah. constantly being used. Um, I, I think your point, uh, Andy, regarding tennis courts and basketball courts, I think that's a good uh, observation overall. Uh, not that uh, tennis is uh, uh, ceasing to exist. Right. Uh, you know, there's still, you know, a number of folks that uh, that play. But uh, you know, if we take a look at the the surfaces that we have here at Veston Memorial Park, uh, Harris Whalen Park, Greenwood Park, um, you know, it uh, it seems as though uh, we're keeping up with uh, the basketball. We're not keeping up with uh, the pickleball side of that. Uh, and from a basketball standpoint, um, you know, I think it would be good to get that input from Andy. The only area that I have heard uh, consistently requested for considerations for basketball court has been at Rothfuss. Um, mm -hmm. That um, now that we've got our rectangular fields, right. we've right. got our box field, uh, have heard about that, not tennis, but uh, basketball. So if families are, are there and using uh, the facilities, having a place to shoot hoops. So I've heard that one, but not, <clears throat> I haven't heard strongly uh, many other areas. We got courts here, we got courts at Harris Whalen. So I think that's, uh, that would be a good uh, conversation. But I would, uh, I would say that just, just seeing and, and being more aware uh, here these last uh, several months about pickleball, I see uh, pickleball definitely being uh, a sport growing. Um, and, um, you know, maybe as we take a look at, uh, you know, the potential number of courts there, if in fact tennis and, and uh, basketball are not there, maybe those areas are dedicated for expansion uh, mm -hmm. so that as we look to build uh, and uh, we, we take a look at the use, we have the opportunity to add uh, accordingly and some things like that. But I think checking with uh, Andy is, uh, is good just to... Uh, get that uh, benefit of that. I think unfortunately, you know, in our rec, in our rec master plan, uh, it seems like uh, even though we try to do that every five years, mm -hmm. I think um, I'll only speak for myself that five years ago, yeah. um, you know, we didn't talk a lot about pickleball <laughs> around here. I, I saw it, I saw it uh, down south when I was mm -hmm. uh, down south. But, but now you're hearing a lot more about it. You know, you're seeing things on, yeah. on TV, ESPN, and right. some things like that, yeah. so. Well, there's even a professional <laughs> league now. That's, oh. that's right, that's right. So. And I, and I think, if I recall, I, I won't have this right, uh, Jim Froome can uh, let me know, but it seems to me one of the top professionals is like only 10 or 11 years old, uh, <laughs> so. so. So what were you saying for the expansion? How would you? Um, would it be not so many pickleball and have expansion, or the expansion would be where the tennis courts and? The yeah, I would. Uh, I mean, I might propose that uh, if we didn't, if if uh, we identified that uh, we we had sufficient uh, coverage for tennis, and uh, we had potentially sufficient coverage for basketball, I might say that those areas that are identified on the plan today are part of a consideration of future expansion if needed. Is is what is what a thought was. And just not put anything there and just have right, it. right. Uh, kind of okay. you know dedicate uh, to say okay, here are the pickle, here are the pickleball courts, and then this area would be reserved for uh, an expansion or addition to, to those mm -hmm. based on based on need and usage. That'd be something so, to think about. May I? 
Absolutely. Well, you done. Um, I'd be disappointed if you didn't. Well, I, I guess I just want to add, we sat here at a, a legislative meeting with about probably 35 or 40 people right. from the community that came and spoke about wanting additional, wanting the pickleball. I do think that, I, I, I'm, I don't think 15 courts, I don't know what the exact number is, is it 12 or 15 or something, but I don't think that that's out of line. And when you go around, I've tried to go around now in the community and look in where and what's being done with pickleball ball, and he's, they're right, they are, they are waiting for courts. And they're waiting for indoor courts too, I, I understand that as well. That is a growing sport and I don't think, I, I don't think we're overstating how many, I don't think 15 is too many. Maybe, maybe it is, I, I don't think it is, maybe it is too many if we don't have the correct parking for it. Maybe, maybe that's another thing that we have to look at or maybe it is 12. But I also, but I, but I, I, I see the need, and I'm not even a, a pickleball player. I played once, but I'm not an avid one like yeah. these people, the people are doing it all the time and traveling around, and mm -hmm. the people in the Penfield. I've heard from more people lately that I didn't even know in the community when I'm out <laughs> walking and telling me how they're on their way to play pickleball somewhere. So I do think that this, it, it is something that yeah. we do need. Okay. I would think, you know, sure. I don't know what the exact number is, but I don't want to short them. Are you, you know? a lefty or a righty? You know, I'm left-handed, but I play right-handed everything. Wow. So. wow. Well, and I'm not sure that's too right. Is, it, it could be a phased approach. I mean, we may not build all 15 at one time. We may build six or eight or whatever to start out and then move forward, especially if they're going to assist us in the payment of, of the improvements. Yeah. Well, we have to work through, you know, the funding and right. uh, the contractual and uh, right. things like that as, uh, as we go through. You know, the town needs to have some skin in the game. Uh, I, I believe the town needs to have some skin in the game. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as we're doing with disc golf, there's going to be some potential skin in the game. As we're doing some work with the biking, we're going to have some skin in the game. So I think that's where I think it's important to make sure that uh, we have some understanding uh, that uh, what makes what makes sense, what's fair, you know, and what, uh, you know, we kind of put together by, by way of some guidelines. Okay, um, so um, <clears throat> Jim, Jim, uh, Mark, and I would welcome any thoughts as we uh, sit down with uh, with our friends from BME uh, to talk about. We we certainly can share some of the thoughts about the tennis component, the basketball component, uh, and some of those things. But if you have any additional thoughts, and then one last thought I had, uh, I think to, to Mr. Moore's comment, uh, or maybe to Linda's comment, and that is is that. Um, uh, I, I have also heard, and I'm guessing that uh, uh, Mr. Urfitz as well, as well, is that, you know, indoor, uh, not only the pickleball, but indoor basketball. Um, I think uh, he, he would uh, say to you that if uh, we could keep that court open 24 by 7, there are enough groups and leagues out there. You know, uh, I think of the sheriffs. Uh, they finish up at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, they don't go home and go to bed. Uh, they look for you know, basketball leagues and uh, things like that, volleyball leagues to get out there. And they're coming off at 11, 11.30, you know, can we can we lease uh, the gymnasium uh, from 12 to 1 or 1.30? Oh, wow. uh, the, prob the problem yeah. is, is that, uh, you know, you got to staff it yeah. and uh, not that the sheriffs aren't <laughs> responsible, but, you know, you got to kind of staff it and turn the lights on and, and all that other stuff. So, okay. Anything else? Nope. All right. Um, so we'll we'll uh, we'll hold uh, we'll hold this. Um, uh, I would uh, entertain a motion just that uh, we table it, but uh, and to keep it on the agenda as we kind of move so through we'll this. Second. Okay. So uh, it's been moved by Councilperson uh, Cole, uh, second by Councilperson Moore uh, to table. Uh, seeing no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. LaFountain. Aye. Moore. Aye. Four ayes. Okay, that brings us down to uh, information items. Um, we'll look to Mr. Costello to round out the night for us. Uh, the first one, a request for garage removal reconstruction at 1810 Penfield Road. Actually, it's 1801, but that's fine. Um, 1801, I'm a little it, dyslexic it, uh, this time of night. So <laughs> you were in the I right neighborhood. I apologize. You're in the right neighborhood. All right. You uh, if you I remember, uh, the, the board earlier this year um, had approved <clears throat> an application to allow a chiropractic office in the main structure at 1801, and then the board granted that approval, and then there was a follow-up request to allow the owners to 
refurbish the existing garage and convert that into a small gym rehab area. Um, I just recently received a letter from the owner, Mr. De, uh, De Niro, requesting the board's input. Um, he has done some uh, structural analysis of the building and has found that um, it's probably not worth saving at this point in time. Um, he's then asked if he could possibly tear the building down and then rebuild it um, in the same location, but he would like to add eight feet on to both the side and the, and the back of the building. Uh, to make it more palatable for what his son would like to do at that location. You'll note that the existing building has a 2.3 foot uh, side setback. Um, generally speaking, if, if we allow things to be rebuilt, we try to bring it into a little bit greater compliance with right. the setback requirements. The setback requirement, the minimum is 20 feet, which is probably not realistic based on the fact that there is an access point running out to Mott's Lane and even a portion of this addition um, would uh, encroach a little bit into that access drive, they can re realign it and they probably will restripe it. But um, I'm, I've got to get back to him. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on allowing an addition to go forward. This is a situation where you would probably have to have a public hearing on it. Definitely. And um, certainly, you know, we can do it administratively um, if, if the board wants to, but I'm thinking you want to do a, a public hearing on it and uh, let the neighbors know what the intent is and try to get a better setback than 2.3 feet, especially if he's gonna add on to the size of what's, what's out there now. Right. Agreed. So, um, so has there been any discussion about uh, maybe relocating that uh, to the west? Um, I, I think that's parking area right now, but that doesn't mean that this couldn't be parking area in its place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm not sure he thought about that. I think he was just trying to minimize and make it as easy as possible, but but that might be an option. I can certainly talk to him about that as an option. Uh, I, think, he, I think it would be he, worth it. He may like that better. Least, I right. think it would worth, be worth it because it, it appears as though if I take a look at the access point, uh, you might have a little bit more room uh, coming in on the east side. Definitely. So if you were to put that building on the west side, uh, could you gain, uh, you know, you've got a little bit of buffer there. Yep. Uh, so you could definitely gain uh, or minimize the amount of setback, recognizing that this board uh, kind of uh, oversees uh, that in the Four Corners District. But you could gain a little bit more uh, compliance, uh, which is always the goal. Right. And, um, you know, get uh, what he's looking for and then just do the flip-flop of uh, the parking uh, on the east side versus the west side. That's uh, a just, good idea. Just a thought to... To uh, maybe pose back to the. It's a good uh, thought owner. since they're going to tear down the building. Well, <laughs> you've got any available option of, that yeah. uh, you didn't have before. So mm -hmm. I could talk to him about that, get some input back, and um, let him know that we would like to see some alternative than a 2.3 foot setback if we can make it better. And that is a good option to move it to the uh, mm -hmm. to the west side of the property take, take versus the east at, side. Uh, take a look at that and uh, see if that uh, could again achieve a couple of things. Yep. Not a okay. bad idea. All right, uh, this is an information item, yep. so not looking for a motion. Uh, you, you'll go back and have that uh, conversation, and, and we'll be interested in seeing uh, what uh, thoughts, comments, feedback that he might have. Uh, I will get back this. to you as soon as I hear from him. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments uh, for Mr. Costello on this uh, particular matter? Okay, uh, then uh, our next item is a local law regarding short-term transient uh, rentals. Uh, we talked uh, briefly about it, um, I think, uh, when we were uh, discussing um, the uh, ownership of 2567 Browncroft. Uh, however, we, we do, uh, this uh, draft was put together by uh, Mr. Horowitz and Mr. Uh, Costello. And uh, so <clears throat> the board, I would ask uh, that uh, we would welcome thoughts, uh, input, uh, and, and next steps. Obviously, next steps would be if you had some significant changes, um, get that uh, fed in, and uh, Dick and Jim will review that. And uh, then uh, looking to establish, uh, potentially establish a public hearing uh, to uh, vet this out uh, with, uh, the, with the uh, residents in a public hearing. Thoughts, good idea, bad idea? Sure. Mr. Supervisor. Scrap it. Sorry. No, that's okay. Mr. <laughs> so in, in reviewing this, um, this draft, 
Um, I had a question, and I kind of I on the uh, permit on page five of that. Um, the permit to operate short-term transient shall be for a period of three years from the date of issuance. I know I briefly sp spoke to I think Mr. Costello and Mr. Valentine about it, and uh, I know that it was had to do with with possibly the fact that a year might be too least time for somebody to come in and have to. Uh, to do, you know, a renewal, uh, Jim. If right, you wanna... and, and as also for staff. I mean, that would yeah. that would be several people coming in on a sustained basis, constantly renewing. And, and again, remember that this is not a transferable permit. If if you sell your property within that period of time, the new people have to come in if they want to continue that use. So um, if you got if you got the permit, you were you were three months into the three year period and you sold. Uh, that's null and void. It's and null and void. The, the right. new, and the new folks are back. I just still thought that three years seemed to me too too much time. I mean, a, a too much length of time to. But I understand. I mean, I could be. I, I just think I thought it seemed like an, a long a long period of time. We initially yeah. looked at five. Then we thought we first we looked at one. We thought that was unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at five, and we thought that was way too far out. And came to the middle middle ground of three. Well, that uh, definitely uh, the purpose of holding a public hearing, getting mm -hmm. a sense uh, from uh, folks as to thoughts, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, so at least uh, something to think that's about. That's right, and that's a good point. And then the other part of that, too, obviously, if there are violations uh, to that permit, um, it's, it, it's revocable. I mean, you have the right to revoke that permit. Right. So uh don't board i don't know if you're comfortable saying uh go ahead and get something on the docket for a public hearing would you like another uh, couple of weeks to take a peek at it and uh and then uh come back uh and uh, which would be the uh, 8th of december um with uh any uh, thoughts uh, updates changes and uh, uh recommendations for a public hearing or uh, if your thoughts are we don't need it at all, we would welcome those thoughts, too. We do want you to know that there are people doing that, obviously, in the right. town of Penfield, right. and right. it's it's not been regulated. Um, right. It's good to have a handle on that, to know who is doing it and who isn't. Um, that would be a good way to do an inventory of the town as to who actually <coughs> is utilizing uh, That's the really platforms. Yeah. Okay. I'd okay. be fine to, to move it to a public hearing. I don't know if you, with the time frame we're talking about now, with this late in the year. Well, to give, to give you, I mean, to give you a sense, uh, uh, we wouldn't uh, be able to do anything until uh, December. The question that uh, you always have on the table is that uh, folks get uh, preoccupied yeah. with holidays and uh, things like that, and uh, they tend to be refocused uh, come the second, third, fourth of January. So, uh, do we set it up uh, to maybe? Uh, have a public hearing for the second uh, legislative session uh, in uh, January. Yeah, I would concur. You're good with that. Yep. Okay. You're not even going to be here. <laughs> You'll come back, I know, Andrew, right? <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll be in that thing. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll be back at the, Mr. Supervisor's. Be, there you go. You'll be I'll calling be there. In. You and I will be, in we'll be there. We'll be in the front of the, in front of the He's audience. He's going to present it, Jim. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure somebody will. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, we'll call in. I make a motion then. That we yeah, I think uh, you know uh, so. if uh, if you would like to make that motion, uh, Councilperson, draw to uh, look to uh, establish a public hearing, say the third week in January. Staff uh, can work uh, with the uh, proper advertising beforehand and uh, what have you. So. Um, I would do that. So a motion by uh, Councilperson Draws. Is there a second? second? Councilperson Cole uh, to move forward with a mid-January. Uh, we'll break that news to uh, Marie that uh, <laughs> uh, she will uh, inherit that. And uh, with that, that, and before anybody gets any cold feet, I would enter. I would ask for a roll call vote, uh, Sue, if I could. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. The Fountain. Aye. Moore. Aye. All right. All right. All right. Uh, that brings us to the end of the agenda. Uh, the November 10th, 2021 2021 uh, work session of the Penfield Town Board uh, will stand adjourned at 9.05 uh, p.m. Uh, thank you to everyone that uh, participated. Uh, special thanks to Penfield TV uh, for keeping us uh, 
uh, on online for our residents uh, so that uh, they have the opportunity to see what uh, is going on in all aspects of uh, these items. And as always, uh, please uh, be well and be safe.